Cloud. So let's go a step back. So Blue Cloud is the flagship initiative of the uh, Future of Disease and Oceans program of the European Commission and is implementing a pilot open science platform to allow researchers to uh, perform research in, in, a, in an easy way because we give access to an unprecedented amount of uh, marine data resources and added value services and products, including computing resources and um, uh, uh, facilities uh, to orchestrate uh, virtual labs and experiments uh, in one unique uh, environment. By creating this platform, we aim at promoting open sharing, uh, the sharing of um, data processes and research findings. Blue Cloud started in 2019, so we are in our, let's say, concluding uh, phase and brought together 20 uh, partners among research organizations uh, across Europe and 13 Blue Federated uh, infrastructures that uh, uh, empower the platform by giving access to this unprecedented amount uh, of data. Within this platform, uh, we have five uh, virtual labs that work as real life demonstrators of the um, capabilities and potentialities of uh, the Blue Cloud platform. Uh, they work as real life scenarios in five uh, domains. So from biodiversity to genomics, uh, to uh, fisheries and aquaculture. And today we're going to show you uh, the demonstrators on marine environmental uh, indicators. The uh, virtual lab is uh, open and available for um, the Blue Cloud community and for external uh, users who want to try and develop their experiments there. It's led by uh, the CNCC Foundation in collaboration with IFRE Mercator Ocean and the Royal Netherlands Meteorological Institute and the University of Bergen. And in the lab, you'll find uh, an online service to that provides uh, indicators on um, environmental uh, quality of the oceans. So uh, the service offers um, cap capacity to perform a, a statistical analysis of the quality and the characteristics of the marine environment in the uh, Mediterranean regions. And uh, our experts today will give you a live overview of the services and of the experiments that you can run there. As I said, the, uh, all the virtual labs of Blue Cloud are opened, and in February this year, we run a hackathon that invited uh, more than 150 participants to test uh, the virtual labs by designing uh, experiments uh, on our platform. So we invite you to do uh, so, uh, to do the same, and, uh, uh, and, and, test, uh, and test the solutions there. With that, I give the floor to uh, our speakers today. And I start with Massimiliano Drudi from the CMCC uh, Foundation, who will give a, an introduction to the virtual lab. I also remember that um, we invite you to ask any questions in the uh, Zoom uh, chat or in the question and answer panel. We'll take them uh, during, the, uh, during the webinar and we'll have our speaker, speakers who will respond to that. So Massimiliano, over to you. Thank you. So good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Massimiliano Drudi. And I will introduce you to this uh, uh, virtual lab in which we are developing the Marine Environmental Indicators Demonstrator. Uh, basically, uh, we can consider this as a decision support system which is targeting environmental protection agencies and decision makers in the marine sector. With this uh, development, uh, uh, we aim to foster the consolidation of a science-based uh, approach 
and uh, we also aim to contribute uh, in implementing uh, an holistic view of uh, human activities and, uh, and the environment, uh, which is important uh, to support uh, several initiatives and also, and also to address um, societal needs, for instance, uh, related uh, to the blue economy or uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Well, in this, in this framework, clearly the, the role of the, the science is very important. It plays an important role. And um, um, th therefore, uh, we, we invite also scientists and researchers to engage in, engage in, these, in, these, uh, in this service, for instance, contributing with the implementation of algorithms that can help to extend the, the, the value chain from marine data to knowledge. And in this way, therefore, to improve the, the understanding that we have of the environment and maybe uh, with, the, with a better understanding, also, also a better predictability, which is important for the definition of the policies. Uh, so after this uh, introduction, that is the vision behind uh, this, uh, this service, um, right now the, the actual objectives are um, uh, related to calculate and distribute, uh, for instance, online information and indicators on the environmental quality of the marine area. Uh, then using innovative uh, approach also obtain new at value data applying, for instance, big data analysis or machine learning methods, uh, exploiting the multi-source data sets that today we can obtain by the marine data infrastructures. And finally, enable users to perform uh, uh, interactive operations, such as select, selecting portion of data set or perform statistical analysis or also clearly display the data, which is important for the analysis of the output. Uh, well, so far, uh, several algorithms are available. They, they are available as uh, uh, WPS methods or uh, notebooks in uh, Jupyter Hub. The WPS methods can be exploited by means of the service Mail generator, which provide a friendly user interface to them. And the, the algorithms are uh, uh, the four, five listed here in the table. Uh, ocean climate, the ocean partners indicators, the ocean regimes indicators, the storm severity index, and uh, finally harmonized integrated carbon data. Uh, some of them today are available um, uh, only as a notebook, but uh, it is uh, under finalization, the implementation as a method. The data sources uh, uh, that this service is uh, exploiting uh, are coming from Copernicus service, from Eroargo and the Amodnet. The, the, the products that we use the most are the Mediterranean reanalysis product and the global reanalysis product, then also the ERA5 product and the BC, BGC profiles. Uh, well, actually the, the service can, can uh, is flexible uh, to exploit uh, any product which is uh, compliant uh, with the most, most common uh, data formats. So uh, by default, uh, that's what we, we provide, uh, but uh, uh, it's, it's uh, easy to update it uh, to extend the use to other input data products. The Virtual Lab is available, uh, as you already know, uh through the open access link uh, it is enough to register a user and then all the services will be available uh, once you enter inside the, the virtual lab uh, it will be available a uh, home page with a small uh, with a short introduction to the content of the, of the virtual lab 
and the direct links to, to reach uh, the Med Generator service uh, and uh, also to reach the, the available notebooks. A few final remarks. So in Blue Cloud, uh, this service is continuing proceeding the development. Right now, the main focus uh, is about the development of cap capabilities related uh, to the big data analytics. And shortly, I think uh, there will be also improvement uh, related to the display of data. Then also a, a, big, a big effort uh, uh, has been dedicated uh, to the consolidation of our methodology uh, to bring the algorithm into production production environment. So algorithm from the research to the production in a cost efficient way and also um, in a convenient way for both the research and the target users. Um, then as, um, later there, be, there will be more attention to the underlying infrastructure since the infrastructures are uh, fundamental to deliver a quality, a quality service, a service with a good level of quality. And uh, there are several aspects, uh, features uh, which are important. For instance, is it uh, open? Is it uh, sustained, uh, well performing, uh, and evolving uh, according to the application needs? Um, so the, the idea is to exploit uh, the infrastructures that uh, will be more uh, uh, suitable for the delivery of this uh, service. Finally, the, the challenge, uh, well, right now it's more about uh, big data, but uh, we are approaching the development of the digital twin. And so probably there will be new, new challenges that uh, this, uh, this service will be uh, ready and happy to, to face at the right time. And with this, I can conclude. I thank you, everybody, for the for your attention. I hope this presentation was uh, useful and interesting. And I leave the floor to the next uh, presentation. Thanks, Massimiliano. Yes, I I call Francesco Palermo now from CMCC uh, as well, who will present the Marine Environmental Indicator Framework and. When it gets ready, I confirm that, uh, I mean, you listed the users, the potential target users uh, of the service. We, we have quite a diverse community of people who registered for today's webinar from marine institutes in Europe, but quite a few are also out from outside Europe. So um, it, it's really interesting to see, I mean, the interest of, of uh, uh, for, for this tool. So, um, Francesco, can you? Can I start? Yeah, sure. Uh, we okay. don't see we don't see your screen. Not sure if you're. Okay, I'm okay. starting to share. No, you should see. Yes. Okay. Hello. Good morning, everybody. My name is Francesco Palermo. I work in CMCC with Massimiliano Drudi and Antonio Mariani, who collaborate with me for this project. But uh, today we'll, I'll present the May Marine Environmental Indicator Framework in which collaborated also Kevin uh, Willem for defining uh, its functionality and its features. Let's see what's the aim of uh, the May generator. Uh, the May generator is, should be uh, DSS as said by Massimiliano. It's a web application. It's a, web uh, tool for online computing of new added value data. So the aim is to produce, to leave the uh, user the possibility to produce new value data, selecting a method, which is the, uh, our name for an algorithm for producing data, uh, a particular output type, uh, a data source, uh, a time range, an area, a depth, and also additional specific parameters that are related to a method. Um, let's see which are the steps for, uh, for uh, the workflow for producing a new data as we um, set up them in the, our web application. So the first one is the, 
the, the, the phase for selecting the method, the output type, and the data source of interest for the user. The um, landing page, when uh, the user reached uh, our web application is the this one phase where you can see just the one uh, um, drop down menu um, with the A here indicated for um, from which the user can select the available method from the available method can select that one of his interest. For now, we have just integrated the ocean climate, but uh, as uh, I'll say later, we are working on, on for introducing the other methods. After selecting the method, the user can select the output type of his interest and the data source. So the user can choose by, between different output type, which depends on the method. And in case of ocean climate, there are, um, could be maps, time series, climatologies. After uh, the previous selection, the user can now uh, select the time of interest, the area, the depth, all these uh, um, specific for uh, also other specific information. All these information are related from the, the previous select selection. So they are uh, directly related to the method output time and data sources, data source previously selected. And uh, after the selection, uh, the user can finally submit its job. And uh, let's consider that we have here on the main page, main, main part of the, of the page, the, um, the visibility of the selected area defined in the area. Let's see step three. After the job submission, but it's or, uh, always available in the tab of my requests, the user can see the list of all the submissions. It's a, a table where um, each row um, correspond to one submission. Here you can find, the user can find the method the, he selected, the creation time, the status of the uh, submission that could change from the process started to uh, process uh, succeeded, but also it, con it is considered the process failed. In the outputs column, the user can see different uh, things. In case of process succeeds, such as the first one, there's the show button from which the user can, uh, uh, can see the data produced. If the process is just started here, you can see the, um, the progression of the, of the, of the submission. And also, if the process fail, you can reach from this this field the log for the for understanding what's happening for the submission. Uh, you can also find in, in the other fields of the row the uh, other information for the submission, so the data source, output type, um, field of interest, the area, the depth, the time range. At the end, the user can finally see the data produced. Uh, clicking on the show button the previous uh, you, you saw in the previous slide. And uh, the row pop up with the preview, which is just a preview of the data produced. In this case, you can see is the annual climatology map for the seawater salinity. And uh, uh, um, below the, this image, the user can see four buttons, but they could change in reality. For downloading the image, for downloading the data, I mean the NetCDF file used for, for plotting this image, but also two files of log for, for um, seeing what happened during the process. Um, just um, uh, an overview of what it's available with the ocean climate, with the method produced by CMCC, and the uh, uh, only one included in the main web app. It uh, uh, allows the user to uh, study the sea condition and trend for annual, seasonal, and monthly periods uh, using data source from the CMEMS uh, um, producer for the Mediterranean and the global reanalysis product. And uh, you can see um, um, the outputs added from two types, so maps and temp series. And uh, you can see some example for the maps temp series and the output uh, environmental fields available so are temperature, salinity, water density, kinetic energy, and currents. Uh, 
Okay, now let's look to the architecture for the main generator that we have uh, set up in the last two years. You can see the the main generator is quite it's quite complex because it's composed by different components. Um, as you can see, the uh, single point of access from the typical main user is the main web application, as you already have seen in the previous slide. But the web application has the responsibility to submit the job to the method on the data manner through the um, WPS web service, which is the uh, sort of uh, uh, translator from the uh, request to the, uh, done by the web application to the WPS server, which is on the data miner infrastructure. When the, um, the method received the, the request sent by the web application, it's, it starts to, to calculate, to compute to the output that, we, that will be posed in the DM storage. And uh, at the end, the output will be accessible from the web application, as you saw in the previous slide. During all this process, which is uh, ended by the web application, all the information for the status of the execution, for the information about the, the submission, all the, all the metadata, will be uh, um, registered uh, in the main register, which is the kind of database for, that supports the web app for uh, registering what, what's happening. Um, I put here some technologies we are used, uh, React uh, for the web application, Flask, Python, Docker for set up the container, uh, Spring and MariaDB for the register, which are quite new technologies. Uh, now let's see what's the meaning for, um, what I mean with the adding a new method to the MA. Uh, let's say that we have developed the, uh, an IDL uh, acronym which means the interface definition languages. Uh, we define the, the input parameters that the WPS method expects to start in the processing. So we set up um, the um, specification for these uh, parameters. So any WPS method which is compared with such IDL can receive a processing request from the main UI. And then a compliant method becomes available to the interface, to the user, when the ID specification is then uploaded inside the main register, which, which uh, contains all the status for the web application and methods. Let's take a look to the integration of the algorithm. We have different status of integration because we uh, mainly concentrated on the ocean climate, but uh, uh, also the other uh, method are, uh, have been de developed for ocean patterns indicator, regimes indicator. When uh, you see the, the, um, the symbol for the braces, uh, it's an ongoing process. Uh, so the main um, the availability for the methods, so it's for the ocean climate, but also the other methods, it's an ongoing process. So we are working on that. Conclusion. Uh, we produced a, a very flexible UI for supporting uh, different uh, new methods. So we are, we are able to support multiple methods. We support multiple data sources. And uh, it's uh, quite easy to add a new method. Let's see our perspective. Uh, additional scientific uh, based algorithm can and will be made available in the next month. Um, but we also uh, considering future development of the interface for the user interaction and visualization data, because uh, the, the current style is, is even a prototype. So uh, there are many things to add. And we are also considering to add the WMS based dynamic viewing of data. So now we are proposing just uh, a preview for the data, but for the future, the WMS will, uh, uh, will allow to the user to access dynamically to the maps. I conclude. Uh, thank you. If you have any questions or uh, suggestion, or even if you want to propose our uh, issues for the web application, etc., please write us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francesco, indeed.
feel free to raise any any question you might have. And in the meantime, let's move on. We have Kevin Bellum now from uh, Ifremer and Dobbs, who will introduce the Ocean of Regimes notebook. Uh, hello, everyone. Can you see my screen correctly and hear yes. me? Perfect, yes. Okay. Um, so my name is Kevin Balem. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Ocean Regimes uh, Notebook. This is um, a work that's been led um, mostly by uh, Andrea Garcia um, and Loic Bachelot, um, but I'm the presenter today. We are all from the LOPS laboratory at Ifremer in France. Um, so in the in the previous uh, marine environmental indicators webinar, Andrea presented the the ocean patterns indicator uh, that was uh, mainly about uh, classification of uh, ocean profiles. So um, trying to identify um, structures and coherent structure in the in the vertical. Uh, part of the data set. And uh, here with the ocean regimes uh, indicator, this is basically the same process, but we are trying to identify a coherent structure in the temporal dimension of the data set. Uh, so what we call the regimes. Um, the methodology is the same. Um, we we use uh, what we call the Gaussian mixture model to, to train uh, a data set. Uh, so we feed the model with, a, with some data so that the model can learn to identify those regimes, those time series. And then once the model is trained or fit, we can apply it to uh, either the same data set or a new one to actually sort uh, all the time series into clusters or classes uh, to identify those uh, those temporal structures of the data set. So those two indicators are um, in some way an introduction or some example of uh, what you can do uh, in terms of uh, machine learning based uh, statical analysis. So practically, um, like the Ocean Patterns Notebook, you will find here two notebooks. Um, the first one is what we call the Model Development Notebooks. Uh, this is where you're going to build your uh, classification model. So we are going to use a data set downloaded from the, the CMEMS portal and uh, load it in an XRA data set. And then we're going to feed those data to a uh, a Gaussian mixture model using the scikit-learn library. And once this model is trained, we can save it in a NetCDF file and use it in the second notebook. This is what we call the prediction notebook. And then again, we can download uh, either uh, the same data set or a new one and use the trained model to, to do some prediction. So we, here we're going to sort the, the time series into the clusters using our pre-trained model. And then in the output, we're going to have some files uh, with the prediction, some, some figures, etc. So practically, um, let's, let's go to the, the VRE uh, Jupyter Hub. Um, I'm going to share my um, up. So if you, here I'm on the home page of the VRE. And if you click here on Ocean Regimes, you end up on the workspace. Uh, you are in Marine Env Environmental Indicators Notebook Ocean Regimes. And then you have a readme uh, that explains to you uh, that you can't work on the workspace, but you have to copy uh, the, the zip file onto your Jupyter uh, session. And then you are here on your Jupyter session with your zip file copied and then your zip file uh, unzipped. 
And if you go into the unzip file, you have your notebooks and everything you need to run it. So um, I will go through the two notebooks, um, not too much into details uh, because, it, because it will take too long, but uh, I will go through the main important uh, points. So here we are in the model development notebooks. Um, you don't have much parameter to, to set at the beginning. The most important one in the, it's uh, the number of cluster or class that you want to use uh, in your model. Here it's seven. And then we have to, to load our training data set. Uh, here we use the Motu Python client of Copernicus to download some uh, chlorophyll data. Um, on the Mediterranean Sea and load it into a data set. So here you can see we have a, a year of daily uh, data of chlorophyll uh, that we are going to use to train the model. Here it's a plot of, uh, of the data. Then you have to do some pre-processing pre steps uh, to help the model uh, to be trained. First, we smooth out the data, the time series, by doing a, a weekly mean. Then we have to reduce uh, the dimension to end up with a 2D data set. So there we have latitude, longitude, and time. So we are going to stack the latitude and, le and the longitude on the same dimension to end up with a, a feature dimension and a sampling dimension. Uh, then we want to delete some outliers in the data because here we can see that we have the Black Sea, we have the Gulf of Gascoigne and some lakes. Um, so we apply a mask to, to remove those data. Um, and then we have an important part of the preprocessing. This is the scaler uh, because before training the, the model, we want to, to put all the time series on the same scale so that the model can easily compare everything. Uh, this is the scalar part and you can do that um, in multiple ways. Uh, the standard scalar just remove the mean uh, and scale to the variance, but you can do a mean max scalar on, or um, any, any kind of scalar. Uh, and then we do a, a PCA uh, to reduce uh, one of the dim dimensions to help uh, a little bit the, the model. Then with the scikit-learn library, we can create a Gaussian mixture model with the number of components uh, here, seven. And then with the pre-processed the pre data, which is X, we can uh, fit the model. And we end up with our uh, XRA data set uh, trained. Um, at the end on the, on the, of the notebook, you can find some uh, development uh, tools or, or plots to help you um, design your model. Uh, the, main, the main thing here is the Bayesian information criteria. Uh, this is an indicator to help you finding the optimum number of class of your data set. Um, basically, uh, we do a lot of training with a, a lot of um, different number of classes. And uh, this criteria um, must have a minimum where uh, your number of classes is optimum. Here it's about seven. Uh, so you have to redo this. Uh, uh, several number of times to, to find your optimum number of class. Uh, and then we have to, to save the model uh, at the end of the book. And so in the second notebook, uh, this is the prediction one. We're going to use this uh, save the model to do some prediction. So you're going to find uh, very similar steps here because we we still have to download some data. Um, it can be the same one. So you do the training and then you do the classification on the same data set. Uh, it can be something else. 
So here is the, uh, uh, it's the same steps. Uh, then we have to do the same step of uh, pre-processing because uh, the data we want to classify has to be uh, understood correctly by the model. So we, we have to do the same processing steps um, than for the model. So we, again, we do the a weekly mean, uh, a dimension reduction. Um, we mask all the data. We redo a scalar and the PCA. And we end up with our data set um, with the feature dimension, the sampling dimension, and our variable. And then we can use the still the scikit uh, scikit learn library to do a predict with our model on our data set. And this gives us um, an extra variable here which are the class or the clusters um, for each of the sampling. And the advantage of Gaussian mixture model is uh, that you can also predict the probability uh, to belong to a class. And then you have, uh, well, let's go to the plot. Um, once the classification is done, you can plot uh, a lot of things. This is all the time series that, uh, that has been sorted into clusters. So we have uh, seven uh, classes of time series. Uh, we can already spot that some classes are similar. For example, if we plot uh, the, all the quantile uh, in the same axis, here are all the, the seven medians time series. And we can see that, for example, the, the class zero and uh, three are quite similar. Um, so maybe uh, we could have used six clusters instead of seven. Um, the plot that is most inter is interesting for me is the spatial distribution of your uh, classes. So we can, we can see that uh, what the model um, has considered as uh, the most uh, high intensity regimes, uh, the class two and four are actually coastal uh, classes. And uh, just previously, I was saying that maybe the class zero and three could be gathered. Those are the green and the blue. So maybe it's just one class. Uh, we can also plot the robustness of the prediction. Um, for each sampling, the prediction calculates uh, the um, probability to belong to a class. And then uh, the robustness is the scale probability. So we can tell if uh, our prediction is sure or robust or not. Here in this example, uh, the prediction seems very robust for each class. Um, and then you can also plot the distribution of your uh, time series. Uh, we can see that for some class, uh, we don't have many, many uh, much time series in those clusters. And then finally, we can save everything we have done in a NetCDF file. And uh, once you've done that, you're still in your Jupyter uh, session. So don't forget to copy back everything you've done um, within your workspace. So it's, it's, it's saved. Um, OK, so. Um, well, I'm done with the presentation. I hope I was not too quick on some points. If you have any question, don't, don't hesitate. Uh, and don't hesitate to try the notebooks as well. Thank you. Many thanks, Kevin. Yes, there was a question actually while you were presenting uh, a question by Dominique uh, Obaton from IFMS about the data sources. Uh, she was asking, can your um, Marine environmental indicators generator uh, be used within C to 
data as inputs. So I saw Massimiliano replied already. Maybe you want to. Uh, uh, yes, of course. Yeah, of course. Uh, we, we can use uh, any kind of data as input uh, as long as, as it's well formatted. Um, for example, we can use the Siemens Institute product uh, as input as well. Uh, for the time series, it's well, it's more complicated because you you don't have many many points as time series in those data set. But for the ocean patterns, it's quite it's quite easy to use the Argo data set as input, for example. Great. So thanks. If there are no more questions, let's move to our. Uh, last speaker, so Jan Willem Notboom, KNMAI, will showcase an analysis done with the indicators, the marine environment indicator. Yeah. Yeah, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Dan Jan Willem Notboom from KNMI, the Dutch Meteorological Service. And I will talk a little bit about the storm severity index that can be used to analyze uh, wind conditions. Uh, just a short introduction of this storm severity index. It's actually based on um, an index published by Lekeboos in 2008. And there you, uh, once the wind speed uh, is exceeding a threshold, it contributes to this storm uh, severity index. So it can be used to indicate exceptional wind conditions or circumstances in a specified area and time period, because it also accumulates or aggregates uh, the scores of these individual in this area and, and time span uh, in this formula. Uh, then you could use this uh, to study then the severity of an individual storm and also their impact, but you could also look at uh, complete storm seasons, uh, how they uh, compare to other seasons, as well as a uh, long-term period where you basically start studying storm climatology over a period of more than 30 years. And especially these thresholds can be combined with sea phenomena to see whether they uh, have impact or, or not on, the, on those circumstances or on those phenomena. Uh, from uh, the calculated uh, SSI uh, maps and time series, you can also create a uh, well, let's say from this, this SSI creates area time maps and time series, sorry. And the data that has been used to uh, create the SSI is taken from ERA-5 reanalysis data from Copernicus. Uh, at the moment, it's limited to the Mediterranean Sea and a period of 40 years, uh, but that might be extended over time. Looking further at the methodology of SSI as it has been implemented in the uh, in this theory or in a marine environmental lab. Uh, well, as I said, it uses Copeta uh, Aero 5 data and it has used uh, the hourly year analysis 10 meter wind data above sea uh, for the Met Sea for this 40 year period. And on top of that, uh, for this same area and period, uh, wind speed percentiles have been calculated. Basically, that provides a dyne. A local level of the let's say 10%, 5%, 2%, or 1% max highest wind levels in that grid cell. And when the model starts to calculate, it first calculates from these hourly data daily as day SSI uh, values. And these are then um, summed up for a time period and area that has been specified. Well, this threshold failure I was talking about in the formula is a very important one because there you can specify what you believe is a severe storm or a storm that might impact some sea phenomena. Uh, in that case, you can specify either uh, percentile values. They, they are local, so they are specific for a unique grid cell and they depend on uh, the wind circumstances in this grid cell over a long period. But alternatively, you can use a fixed wind speed value for the entire area uh, of, of your interest. Okay, the, the calculated maps uh, not only calculate the total SSI value, but uh, on top of that, the, also the, the maximum S SSI in a time step is calculated, the average rate, as well as the number of days uh, the SSI is above zero during that period. So that are the parameters. 
And from then this map data that has been calculated as well as the time series data for the entire areas and time span, uh, the plots can be generated uh, as I will demonstrate in the notebook. Uh, and uh, let's say this, this whole calculation has, can be controlled uh, in the notebook as well later on in the my interface uh, by specifying then a time interval and a step size uh, your area of interest, so sort of a bounding box within the Mediterranean Sea now. Uh, of course, the, the thresholds you are going to apply uh, in this SSI calculation. And finally, the SSI variables you would like to plot, uh, and it can be either maps or time series plots. And at the moment, uh, this whole model or calculation or methodology is only available in the notebook that you are working on to make it a um, web processing service or a method that will be connected to this my generator. Um, to give you a little bit of an idea about this notebook, I don't do it live, so I took some uh, snapshots from the notebook. Well, it starts with a sort of description uh, what this notebook is all about. And then, uh, the, then uh, you basically select a source uh, data. In this case, it's the entire Mediterranean area uh, uh, and that's then indicated. Uh, so this is the area you can use uh, to do your SSI calculations. Then next you have to specify your calculation parameters. And in this notebook, I just use some widgets where you can specify your output name of the output file, the, the time period, etc., cetera, the, the bounding box, the steps, and as well as your threshold values. And then you basically, in the next step, this input is calculated coming to the SSI calculation parameters that is, has then subsequently be used to start these SSI calculations. And uh, while doing this SSI calculation, a progress bar is presented. And to give you an indication for a 40 year period of the entire Mediterranean Sea, using yearly steps, it took yeah, it takes around five minutes. It's a little bit depending on the size of machine you select in, in your calculation. Uh, so it's not taking very long. Uh, once this calculation is then completed, the output is saved in a CDF file, and it includes both the, the grid data or map data as well as the time series data. And then in this notebook, you can decide on what from this output data you would like to plot. And therefore, there are some plot options so you can select the parameters you want to plot and you can decide whether you want only to have map plots or you want also to have a time series plot. And because um, map plots are created for every time step, uh, there is a sort of, uh, to avoid that you by accident start creating a thousand plots, uh, a limit is put in and it's put on 50 now. Um, but um, this is just to avoid that too many plots are created. Okay, then uh, basically what, what then uh, the, the, the plotting starts to do is creating these map plots. Uh, they are seen in the notebook, but they also saved in uh, PNG files in the output directory. And here you see three years from out of 40 years uh, that present the SSI uh, for the entire Mediterranean area and also for the completely year uh, using uh, uh, the, the 89 percentile uh, uh, as a threshold value. Uh, and the other plot is then this time series plot. And here you see uh, uh, a period of 40 years of the total SSI uh, of, or the, the SSI data over the entire area summed up. And here you see then uh, yeah, that it's fluctuating in these years a little bit. So you can see whether, the, let's say, the, the, the amount of storm is in increasing the last years, but as, as far as my impression is, it's a little bit increasing the last years, but you don't see as yeah, a really trend upwards, but uh, therefore you need even more data than 40 probably. Um, so that's the impression of the notebooks. Uh, then I can show you some case studies that uh, have been performed. So as I said, you can study individual forms or medicanes that are Mediterranean cyclones. I presented here two, two, the NUMA, which was in 2013, and it was uh, before the coast of Marseille, and the Sorobas, which was in September 2018. Here you nicely see this cyclone, and this is actually SSI data for a short period, only one day. 
Uh, but you could also, of course, uh, look for entire storm seasons. And here I took five years of data. And you see nicely that during the winter period, the, the scores go up. And also in terms of the total SSI, as well as uh, rates and, and number of days, etc. And finally, you can, of course, do these uh, long-term uh, studies for 40 years. And I picked out, uh, let's say, three years. And uh, the 81, which was quite a stormy year, and you, you see the areas that were most affected by, by storms. And then you have, uh, a, a, let's say, a low storm year in 1992, which is quite low here. And a more average is 2003, that, uh, that there, there have been two major storms basically around the, the Baleares and in, uh, before, before the Greek coast. So that's, uh, that are the, these case studies. Then finally, I have some conclusions. So I believe that uh, SSI can be used to uh, indicate exceptional wind conditions, but these threshold values are very important and they can be tweaked or tuned towards uh, the impact you would like to know on, on certain sea phenomena, like uh, uh, let's say sea circulations or sea eddies as you wish. Uh, another thing is, of course, you can, as I just uh, demonstrated, uh, use it to study individual storms, seasons, as well as the climatology of an area of a sea area. Okay, the notebook I presented is okay, but it's not all not very ideal to handle user user to handle the user interaction. Okay, I provided widgets, but it's not so bad. I think recently the, you have also some dashboard software where you combine Jupyter with Streamlit, so that might offer better indication. But much more better is, of course, the, that we implement this SSI in a method in a word web processing service, and it will be soon available. And then the user control is done via the MSI GUI, where uh, the, and also where they also the output can be viewed, and perhaps also some GIS uh, functionality will be added to this my GUI. Um, okay, this is. Uh, at the moment, it's still limited to the Met Sea area in the spirit of 40 years, but hopefully it can be extended to a much more larger areas of oceans and seas. Um, yeah, that's basically what I would like to present. So I thank you, and if there are any questions, uh, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Jan Willem. We hope that you find this, uh, this uh, overview useful. While before we close, I mean, uh, we would like to ask you, ask our participants to stay two minutes more and help us with a very quick survey that we have set up for you. It's just to get the, I mean, where are you from? As I said, we, we, we saw many different uh, representatives of different institutes, oceanographic and marine institutes in Europe and outside Europe registering for uh, this webinar. So let me share my screen. Yes, this one. Can you see? So if you uh, type in any of your devices, can you, can you see it? Yes. On Mentimeter. Uh, share, let me share it again. Okay. Here it is. So if you go on menti.com and type the, the codes that you can see there. So 184396. We simply ask you a few questions. Where are you uh, joining from? Palma, yeah, it's in Spain, something uh, there. But we, I mean, maybe they're not joining today, but I know we have people registered from Australia and uh, quite a few also from the, the African region, different. Uh, um, countries. France is also very present. Italy, Belgium, yeah. Thanks. And, and yeah, the next question is simply for which institute uh, do you work? Of course, we have this information uh, from the registrations list, but it's, uh, it's always useful, yes, to see who attended and what are the research institutes that we could collaborate with.
Campus Mundial de la Mer, and this is also nice. We are probably doing to offer you something more uh, together with the Campus Mundial de la Mer in, uh, toward the end of the year, probably a second. The collaboration for an hackathon will be set up. Okay, and, and then the last one. So uh, we are asking the participants of these webinars if they would like to uh, have a, a dedicated follow-up meeting with the virtual lab leaders to understand it better, to have a try to ask for a dedicated virtual lab to be set up or to test uh, any of the um, data sets or software or computing resources there is there. Remember that, I mean, Blue Cloud, uh, virtual research environments, the platform, the services are there for the community to be used. So uh, there is the possibility to create a space to offer you uh, support and training. And as you've seen, the uh, virtual lab leaders are still working to customize some of the solutions to adapt to the user needs. Uh, so really we welcome uh, user feedback uh, on any uh, matter. So please do so. so. So thanks, it looks like there is quite an interest. So the next step is we'll get back to you. We'll put you in contact with the, with the virtual lab leaders and allow you to uh, schedule a follow-up meeting. And, and then of course, I mean, uh, we're, we're here to support you. So we hope that you find this webinar useful. Keep on following Blue Cloud channels for updates on the upcoming initiatives, get in touch with the VRE managers and try uh, what you can find in our open science uh, platform. Thank you very much and have a nice rest of the day.